Today is chapter 17 in the Gospel of John. And we have gone through all the events that began in that upper room. And now we're going to be at the conclusion of that. And next time we'll be coming Holy Week. And I know that we look at uh, all the events went on. We, we've been weeks doing this, weeks doing this. But now we've come to that point now where we get to recognize where Jesus, the whole reason why he came was that so he could go to that cross. And that would be the bridge for us to come for eternal life. So Jesus now prays for the church. So let us now also enter into prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you for the gracious gift you've given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you, Lord, to send your Holy Spirit of wisdom upon us as we begin to look at these chapters and begin to recognize the fact that our own minds need to be clarified. We need to understand what you have called us into and what the price that you paid that we could spend eternity with you. And I ask, Lord, the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you. For you are my Lord, my God, my rock, and my redeemer. So come, Holy Spirit, my heart is open to you today. In Jesus' name, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. As Jesus prays now begins for the church, it says, when Jesus has spoken these words, and I thought, what words? See, you kind of forget chapter 16, right? These words, what he said at the end of that, he said, um, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, he says, every man to his home, and will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said this to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And when he goes from that point now to this prayer, he is actually talking directly to the Father. He's not talking to the apostles. They are eavesdropping. They are given privy to hear that information. And I thought about how often I hear a sermon, or I hear uh, somebody talking about something, and it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. And I was thinking that when we recognize the fact that John wrote these words down, we also recognize the fact when Jesus said, I will send the counselor, the advocate for you, and he will remind you of what I said. So it is that gift that God gives us that we can remember what we hear. And not only hear that, but we can also share with others. So when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. And I thought about that, that physical of the, the position that he had. He's lifting his eyes to the heaven. One of the things that I recognize the fact that remember that he had left the upper room, uh, that we had seen that back in the end of chapter 14. And so now he lifts his eyes to heaven. Um, it indicates to me that, that he is now on the outdoors. Judas had already left following the foot washing, remember in chapter 13. After Judas left, leaves, he tells them to love one another for the events that are now coming might create a blame game. Maybe that can oftentimes, well, you did this and you did that. And so he's recognizing the fact that, that uh, he's calling them into that relationship. But he also ends in that chapter in 13 that Peter's going to deny him three times. Well, how's that going to make you feel? You know, you're going to deny him three, three times, you know, and the rest of them are all listening to this. But, you know, the fact is that now Peter has been singled out for something that it must make him feel, never, never, I'll never do that, never do that. Have you ever said that? You know, no, I would never do that. And then as soon as you say that, boom, there you are in that situation. So the beginning of chapter 14 says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And then he talks about the rooms that he's preparing for us. Now, that should make you feel good. You know, I'm looking at a picture of my wall back there, and there's a, like a hotel in, in Italy. And I'm looking at, this, uh, at the pictures and all the rooms in there, and I'm thinking, yeah, that's pretty, but nothing compared to what he's preparing for, for me. And he says, and now I'm going to prepare that place for you. And then he's going to say um, that I'm going to come and take you to be with myself. Will you be where I am? So he says, well, where are you going? He says, well, you know the way. Uh, no, we don't. We don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? That's the question is. And then Jesus at that point says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Remember those words, because those are so significant in the whole picture of what we're talking about here. And he says, he reminded them that he, Jesus, and the Father are one God. They're not three gods, one God. Three persons in that one God. Then comes 
the promise of the Spirit of Truth, the Counselor who will be with them forever. Of course, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one God. You understand that, right? We understand what that means. Do we really understand what that means? One God, three persons, three distinct persons that have certain roles in their lives, in our lives. Jesus reminds us that those who keep his word, and that's a very significant statement too that I see in this chapter, all oh, the number of times, I think five, five times, I think he then mentions the word, the, uh, uh, word, word. And we, we know that that means that when we are recognizing that the word is implanted into my heart, not just my brain, it has to go through my brain and come down into my heart and take up residence there. And he says that at that point, the triune God will dwell with me. Now comes the promise of peace. God's peace is not of the world, but you, when you are in Christ, you know what he means. Uh, we talk about, you know, peace be with you, and Easter, at Christmas we said peace on earth. We know what that means, not just what an absence of war. We know that means that rec recognizing the fact that God's peace is not defined by the world's kind of peace. He says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Again, repeating that. Um, and then out of all the eleven, there was only one, by the way, that was at the cross. The writer of our gospel. The only one. And he says that they're talking about being afraid. John was not afraid. Why was John not afraid? I thought about this, you know. Why was John not afraid to go to the cross to be there? Because he was with Mary. And that, to me, is extraordinarily significant. Because Mary has been given to us as a mother. And so here John has that relationship with Mary so he can boldly, everybody else has run away. And we're going to see that in the next chapter. Everybody's going to run away. And, uh, but not John. John is going to boldly walk up because he has that relationship with Jesus, but also with his mother. And chapter 15 talks about the vine. Remember, we talked about the vine. That's a visual, you know, about uh, branches that are broken off. And now walking toward the Mount of Olives, there must have been some great uh, um, vines in view, uh, connecting that meal again with the vine. So much of this has got so much connection that it almost makes you kind of excited to even talk about it, to read it again. And then we have the promise of transubstantiation, by the way. For those who know that word, that means that that bread and wine are taken by the priest, offered to God, and it is through that Holy Spirit, that gift, that those are changed into the body and blood of Christ. And that is a, a, a crux of our faith. That is a foundation of our faith. Our faith. And it seems like they're bearing fruit, can, uh, bringing that bearing the fruit. And we're going to see this every day of our lives, bearing fruit. Now I'll also bring you, um, uh, re remember it's from last week's lesson, at the end of 16. I have said all this to you, he says, to keep you from falling away. I suggest that you take this to heart today. Because recognizing the fact that you think you're secure, you think that nothing will ever be, ever, is that, could that happen? I'm aware of that. One of the things that for 50 years, almost 50 years, I've been in this relationship, this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm always aware that I could fall. I could fall. I can never be that overconfident as well. And for those who were in the Bible study last year and the rise and fall of ancient Israel last year, uh, and being pretty faithful in that study, remember how astonished that we were that the prophecies for ancient Israel played out in America and in the entire world, almost like a blueprint that was given us what was going to be happening. It's now almost a year later, and so many things are thinking about there that things have to go back to normal. See, everybody's got all their hopes on the vaccine because they say that once they have the vaccine, the cure all, we're going to go back to normal. Don't count on that. Don't count on normal, because normal is opposition to God. Our country right now is uh, suffering with great sin. We have another kind of virus, and that is the virus of sin. And Jesus had told us, he says, the warning that the Holy Spirit is coming to convince the world of sin. What is the sin that he mentioned? The rejection of Jesus. That was sin, rejection of him and of righteousness. Remember, righteousness was the uh, rightness with God, 
and of judgment. And there's going to be a judge coming and hope, hopefully that we are in a relationship with Jesus that we will not have to go through that judgment. He said, the world is judged because I go to the Father. And these words are hard to understand as Jesus tells them so many more things. Now we're on overload. And you're probably on overload is what this past year. Overload. We have almost like we talk about overload like it's burdened me down. No, he says, you might, might feel like that. But here's the bottom line. Here is the bottom line for us today is that Jesus is telling that you might weep and lament, but your joy, your sorrow is going to be turned into sorrow. Now that's a great hope for me. The good thing about living today is Jesus is risen. Even though we are going through the Lent season, we already know at the end of the book, right? You ever have a book, you know, when you're a kid, you have to look to the back, you know, because it's so exciting, you want to find out how it ends? Well, I'm, I'm telling you that at the end of the book, the book of Revelation, we wept. We win. Jesus wins. And I remember a person was telling a class that I was in. He said, now you're going to study the Old Testament, and, uh, but you have to study it like you don't know about the New Testament. Try and forget that. You can't. You cannot forget what you already know. I mean, I cannot look at the Old Testament and not know the New Testament. So we know how it turns out. And there's no reason for us to move around with these sad faces, sorrowful faces. So now this is taking place out in the open skies, which I believe is happening here. And he says that um, the hour has come. He says he lifted up his eyes to heaven. I start my morning, every morning. I'm a very, very early, really riot, sir, about maybe 3.45, maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll sleep into 4 o'clock. But I get up and I have that first hour, hour and 15 minutes that I spend in the scriptures and in prayer. And the first thing I do is I read Psalm 141. I mean, 121. This is what it says. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And then it goes on, and I'll, I'll let you read that, to take some time just to read that Psalm 121. Because we know that lifting my eyes, I go out and I, I go out the, I, uh, for a walk in the morning. I go out very early in the morning, uh, early morning walk. I'm out at 5, 515, and it's dark. And I, that morning, after I had read that, I went outside after about Jesus lifting his eyes up. I went outside and I looked at the sky. I said, Lord, you know what? I've been so busy putting buttons in my ear that I could hear music on the way, and I forgot to look up. So I took the buttons out of my ear and I walked around. I didn't do that exactly very long because you got traffic in the street, right? So, but I looked up there and I'm thinking, God is so magnificent. He is everywhere, and I'm looking at what Jesus is saying. He's lifting his eyes to the Father. Um, St. Stephen, as he was being stoned uh, with Paul, uh, uh, at the time called Saul, was watching um, it going on. And what did Stephen do? He lifted his eyes, and what did he see? He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, standing there. Jesus is sitting, right? But now he stands up. Why is he standing up? Because he's going to welcome Stephen into eternal life. He's going to welcome him there. So the sky is clear and crisp. And I thought about this prayer. And I looked to heaven and Jesus, just as Jesus would have done. And a monumental moment for me. This was a monumental moment for me. This was like the aha moment of this gospel. The aha moment. And I can honestly say that this gospel and this particular chapter has, prof uh, has affected me profoundly. And he says... Since you have given him power over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. And it might be good to memorize this one. This is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That is eternal life. Is to know. To know is to really feel it in here. Not just have a general knowledge about it. And he says, and then he says in verse 4, I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work. I thought, you know what? I hope I can go through it at the end of my life and say, I've accomplished what you called me to do. I've accomplished it. And I think that asking God for the grace to be able to accomplish today what he's calling me to do, and tomorrow what he's calling me to do, and right up to the end of my life, he says, Jesus says, shows me that he has accomplished everything that he set out to do. Those, all of those three years, he has had his one vision as to at this particular, uh, the end of this, uh, in this life as well. And he says, now, he says, glorify me in your own presence with the glory which I had with you before the world was made. 
he had, you know, I'm looking at this. What does he mean by this, to glorify me in your own presence? He's already glorified, right? He's also, oh, he's God. But remember, he is in a different form now. He's in a physical body, flesh and blood like us. And that flesh and blood, he says, I had the glory before. You know, I was with you, I've been for all eternity, you know, that we know the Father, Son, and Spirit have been forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, no beginning. But now he's down in the flesh. And now he says, glorify me, this flesh. So a human flesh now has been glorified. And he says that same glory that he had before he came to earth in the flesh is now also his. He says, I have manifested your name. And he says, I told him all of the good stuff. I told him everything that was. And remember what they said last time Jesus was, was just saying, oh, now you know. Remember they said uh, that uh, now we know that you know everything. That, if you remember, if you really looked at that statement that when, when they said that, now we know that you know everything. That was the declaration of his divinity. That was it. And now he says, now you know. After all this time, now you know. And that's what I want in my own life, to have the recognition that Jesus is revealing things to me, and I want that kind of clarity. He said, I gave them the word, and they received it. And again, we are in the word today. We are in the word of the Gospel of John. These words are going out, and if we're taking them in and believe that that God sent uh, the God the Father sent the Son to us as well. He says that those are the ones that we are recognizing that He's calling us into that relationship through the Word, through the Word. And we know that we open this Bible. These are the words that we're studying. These are the words, and where do they come from? He says it came from uh, 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 God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit has sent those words out from the very beginning in the Old Testament all the way through. And now we know that he has, had given these words and uh, Matthew, Mark, and John, um, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, recorded those words. And is now that we have the gospel, not only that, but we also have Luke, who also did the rest of it as well, through uh, the, the, the writings uh, and the Acts of the Apostle, and we have the letters. All of these things are all scripture that's been given. He says, I'm praying for them, and I'm not praying for the world, because he says, the world, you know, has been invited. But you can't pray for people who don't want your prayer. You can't pray for people who could care less. And he says, uh, I am no more in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name. As we are one, let them be one. And he says, and again, I like this. He, he says, I kept them in your name. I have guarded them. All these three years, things could have happened. But he never allowed it to happen. And he will never allow anything to happen to me unless he has a purpose for it. And I, I, he said that uh, I do not pray that you would take them um, out of the world. They're, they're, they have to be in the world. We have to go in the world. I can't stay inside my home here and just you know, uh, keep the world out because the world's a bad place to be in. No, I have to go out. I have to go out. But he says, I am not part of that world. I am in the world, but not part of that world. And he says that, uh, reminded me, you know, of um, Job. Job, you know, uh, the story of Job, I know it, it goes on and on and on and on about Job's suffering. And one of the things in the very beginning of the book of Job, um, that Satan comes prancing around, he says, uh, and, and God tells Satan, he says, have you seen my servant Job? Um, you know, look at how righteous he is. And, uh, and Satan says, yeah, right, God. You, you have a hedge around him. You can't touch him. So God says, okay, this is what you can do. And he could, he, he could affect all of his, um, his belongings and stuff. So he loses all of that. And he says, well, you're still protecting him. So he removes the hedge. And poor Job loses not only everything he has, but he also loses his physical health and suffers greatly from that. God keeps the hedge around those and only allow Satan to have a certain uh, a terror. He was, uh, um, Satan was never allowed to touch Job's life, protected him from that. He was not allowed to do that. And he says that um, Satan is going to try, and sometimes God is going to allow things to happen in our lives. They're going to happen to put, so that God will either teach us or we will be an instrument to teach others, to share that as well. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. And he says, I'm going to send them into the world and not only pray for those, but he's going to pray for us. You know, I was at uh, Adoration the other day, and I was reading that, and I'm thinking, my gosh, Jesus is praying for me. 
praying for me because I am here today because of those he prayed for because of their testimony 2,000 years ago has now touched my life and changed my life. And he says, for those who believe in me through that word, their word. And he says that they may all be one as you and Father are, as we are in each, in each other. And I in you, that they might be in us. You know, sometimes that concept might be a little difficult to, to uh, envelop. You know, just ask God to clarify you how he means that. That, that, that you and me and, you know, Father and the, and the Son, that the love we have, we see it in one another. We see it in our community. We see it in those, those of us who share the word. He says, the glory which I have, you give me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And then he says, I and them and you and me, and they may become perfectly one. And this is what, you know, when we, Paul talks about, you know, breaking the bread, uh, that we share the one loaf, we are one loaf in him, and that the world may know that you sent me. That's the testimony that we give. And we can, we can uh, cause um, uh, harm to the church by our behavior. It is how we love each other that the world is going to recognize that. He says uh, that also, that I uh, desire that they also be whom you have given me to behold my glory. This is the exciting part. This to me is the most exciting hope that we have, is that he says, um, I desire that, it, that it, it, uh, those you've given me, that they will be with me where I am. Where is he? He is in heaven waiting for us. And he says, I've been there since before the foundation of the earth as well. Read the book of, uh, of, of, of Revelation. I might be doing that next year. I might be part of the study. I might, if, I, if I'm around next year. Okay. Uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, he he uh, ascended uh, as he was called uh, John, still alive, mind you, he's still alive. He was shown a vision, and the shown a vision is that he heard a voice, and uh, and it's in the first uh, uh, chapter, second chapter of the book of Revelation, and uh, he heard the voice, and he turned around and he thought, what? Where's that voice coming from? And it was the Lord Jesus Christ in his glorified state. You know what John did? He passed out. He said he passed out like he was dead because we cannot see the heavenly uh, uh, God in our human flesh. We cannot see that. Jesus and God even told Moses, no man can see me and live, not in our human flesh. So we're gonna get to see him when we get to be with him for eternity. And he says, I made them known to you, uh, your name, and I will make it known that the love which you have loved me may be in them. And that's the invitation we have. We have to be recognized in the fact that he's, it's his love. And this love enables me to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what we're called to do. And invite others in. To evangelize. To evangelize. To share with others. And um, I, I know that I've attempted to do this sometimes, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes people say, yeah, you know, I could do that. But people say, I don't need it. I don't need it. And I said, don't ever say you don't need it. Because when your life ends, you will need it. So better sure, make sure that you're in that now, the invitation as well. Bishop Barron has a tremendously great video out, by the way, um, and I'm going to give a little um, uh, uh, plug on that one. It's called Evangelization. And uh, I was listening to this. I'm going to go back and listen again and take notes because he's talking about why the youth are leaving the church. Why are they stepping away? Why have they lost that faith? One of the biggest uh, atheistic um, uh, person who shares on the, uh, he was mentioned this name, um, that uh, on the internet is an ex-Catholic that an atheist and he promotes he's a very popular speaker he promotes atheism so what's wrong with us how come we can't promote spirituality in youth and lord in the lord jesus christ he's he's made known his name to us and we have to make it known and have that same love that same drive that jesus had in this prayer reread this prayer reread it over memorize it and have it resonate in your mind First thing in the morning, the last thing at night, and every all the hours in between. Because we know that he's called us into that relationship. And particularly, as we're going to be doing uh, the um, a letter of John, uh, the, uh, the, the, the first letter of John, through the next two weeks. 
these are going to be a lot of reminders of what we've already been through in this gospel. So let us keep our sights on what Jesus has called us into. Let's keep our sights on him, never looking away, never getting distracted. And I'm saying this mainly for myself because I get distracted easily. So we just ask, Lord, that you send us that spirit. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus, Lord, into our lives. <clears throat> and help us to be witnesses, Lord, to the world out there that is searching for something true. They're searching for the truth because we see very little truth today. So we just ask, Lord, that we will be those instruments to bring those that flock in, and that we occupy, um, I say populate heaven, how's that? Populate, give us the ability, Lord, to repopulate heaven, to call people into that. And he says that, um, that you've called us into this relationship, and what a great gift that is. In Jesus' name I pray, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.